Week five, thinking out loud, lecture 2.1. Speaking, singing, dancing, gesturing, thinking out loud, writing, drawing, painting, carving and sculpting, cave paintings, hieroglyphics, writing and literacy, and the emergence of graphic arts. Schools have infelicitously tampered with students' ability to communicate effectively by hamstringing us into reading, writing, arithmetic. With such a strong bias toward writing, that we forget the evolutionary origins of the other modes of communication, from gesture to dance to tones and music and graphics. And as a consequence, we've left many more impactful hybrid communication methods to professional artists and designers who've been given permission to be creative but simultaneously marginalized by society when they do so in service to any messages other than the propaganda of those benefiting from the status quo. This certainly constrains our collective ability to democratically design and communicate a better future with liberty and justice for all. So here, we explore all the other early methods of communication that we evolved before computer technology changed everything. You may not think that the more artistic modes of human communication have much relevance to sustainability. Certainly, there are very few science teachers who encourage students throughout their academic careers to demonstrate their knowledge concerning academic subject matter using gestural or whole body communication. When I first started working as a professor of natural sciences and environmental psychology at Mercy College in the Manhattan and Dobbs Ferry, New York campuses, I would have never considered these media as germane to content exposition. For somebody trained as a man of letters, tasked with creating other wordsmiths by a system obsessed with students' writing skills that presupposes the only path toward a good career involves symbols and syntax on paper, I would have never considered other forms of expression as valid. That is, until I met a student in my new Psychology of Environmental Sustainability and Justice course in downtown New York City who was a dance major. He prevailed upon me that for the first, for his final project, he should be allowed to do a performance art piece that invoked the helplessness and anger he was feeling confronted by climate change and the recent traumatic aftermath he had experienced as a victim of Hurricane Sandy. Since he had already decided his career path as a performing artist, who was I to argue with him? One of our obligations as teachers is to help students prepare for the uncertain job market, and students are investing enormous amounts of money, time, and resources, and emotional energy with the huge and unfair burden of out-of-control student loans in the hope that what they learn and do in college will help them when they get out into the real world. <clears throat> The student's name was Robin D. Sena, and what he created for our program was an incredible piece of performance art. He constructed, uh, that is mashed up, an orchestral piece of music that also used targeted narration to express the peaks and valleys of his experience, edited a haunting video to accompany it filled with startling imagery of real and psychedelic environments juxtaposed with imagery of his own face and body, as well as keywords broadcasted on a screen behind him in our darkened classroom. And then he placed a chair in the middle of the room and did an evocative contortionist live dance to add hyperdimensionality to the experience. It was a stunningly impactful and visceral piece that got more people in the class talking about climate change and sustainability and environmental justice than any paper could. But lest you think that such creative talent must be decoupled from literary deliverables, Rovin demonstrated how the freedom to create and communicate viscerally could work as the perfect vehicle for thinking out louder through text when he wrote this beautiful sentiment in his final My Utopia paper for our environmental psychology class that I think beautifully expresses the need for colleges to allow all students to express themselves and the healing effect that can have. He wrote, quote, one of our most detrimental lessons that have prevented us from living in the utopian society I see for this planet is the education system. Like it says in the quote above, U.S. schools are like prisons. The fact that we have to get searched and watched is very sad. As a personal experience, when I arrived to Mercy College, it was a very difficult transition from high school to college because I was not taught most of the things I need to succeed in a college-level education. Just like Professor Culhane taught our class is the epitome of how our education system should be moving towards. 
Professor Culhane let us have complete freedom of expression. With this going back to the first question I posed, this can go many ways as you interpret it. I asked, can we handle total freedom of expression? From my perspective, it was a hard transition from going to rules, from rules to no rules in some ways. The freedom to express ourselves in school is something that I've never heard before. I know that it may sound strange, but think about it. Have we ever had total freedom of expression? Everything in our school life has been planned out from the first day of the school year and leaving no room for creativity. My utopian society, said Rovin, would have classrooms where kids are not judged on grades. They would have complete total freedom of expression. Every person on this earth has a voice and we can all learn something from the person next to us if we just listen. To answer the questions for me, I don't think that I was able to handle freedom of expression to its fullest extent. The reason why is because I was so conditioned in my elementary, junior, and high school years that when I received the gift of voicing my ideas for a better world, my thoughts were completely blocked. The only way that I could immerse myself in complete freedom of expression was through my dancing. When I danced in front of the class, I let everything I was holding inside spill out. When I dance, I don't think about anything or, or if anyone is judging me, I just let it all out and I think that we're going to achieve whatever type of utopia we want to achieve. We must not be afraid to think. It may seem like an easy thing to do, but we've been conditioned that if we think outside the box, we are going to be looked at like we are quixotic and we'll be laughed at. The more the class accepted who I was, the more I let my inner thoughts out. Life is an evolution, and I think that it's time for a revolution if we want to survive as humans because then the more we don't allow each individual to express their natural born rights, the more we're destroying ourselves, end quote. My response was, amen, brother. Thanks for sharing your light and brilliance and having so much inspiring courage to do things your unique way in class this semester. That's what I wrote him. And because Robin had the courage to think out loud through dance and music, subsequent students in the class began to explore their own unique voices and their own ways of expressing their visions of a better life. So word got out that in my science classes, students from the arts could find a welcome home. And performance art became almost par for the course as more creative types began to enroll. What E.O. Wilson says about the urgent need to remarry the arts and sciences in his book, The Origins of Creativity, becomes perfectly clear to anybody who actually performs the marriage ceremony in their classrooms. The offspring birthed from this sacred reunion feels so beautiful and whole, and learning and sharing becomes as joyful as it is impactful, just like